Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today with uh, for Urban Noise, Physical and Mental Health Impacts with Dr. Oyamo and Dr. Doring. Uh, my name is Ingrid Boudet, and I'm the founder of No More Noise Toronto, a grassroots community of volunteers that are taking a data-centered approach to advocate for reducing noise pollution. Uh, we made an impression during the city's noise bylaw review. We had well over 40 people make deputations. Um, and so now we're collaborating with stakeholders such as Toronto Metropolitan University, University of Toronto, and lucky enough, the City of Toronto to improve processes, outcomes, and to hopefully show the improvements of noise reduction through data. Today, we'll be hearing how noise impacts our health, whether we are annoyed or notice it or not. Um, and we'll also hear about a new research area, how noise impacts us mentally, both when we're being subjected to it and when the noise is finally gone. Um, and some of my questions in the Mentimeter are related to that. <clears throat> so first, some housekeeping items. Uh, in the webinar today, you'll be off camera and on mute. Please feel free to participate in the chat with comments and questions. The three of us will be monitoring the chat. So a suggestion might be is to hold off putting your questions in the chat until Dr. Oyamo's presentation. I'm sure he's gonna answer some of them. He's a wealth of knowledge. Um, so that would help us out. And then we'll do our best to get through uh, all of the questions in the Q&A. Lastly, this is being recorded and will be available on No More Noise Toronto's YouTube channel in a few days. I like to get it up nice and early for you. So before we get going, um, I actually just need to do one thing here as we are um, working on, I'm flying solo a little bit here. So I'm just gonna put a couple things in the chat. And that means multitasking, which is always interesting. So here we go. So this is uh, to join the Mentimeter code is now in the chat. <clears throat> so before we get going, I would like to make a land and environment acknowledgement. And while many land acknowledgements focus just on the treaties, I would like to make this opportunity, take this opportunity to focus not on the lines that were drawn on the map, but on the land itself. The health of an environment or ecosystem can be assessed by the sounds coming from it. And all indigenous peoples did that for a millennia and developed a way of listening that we have lost. May we reconcile not only the lines that were drawn on those maps, but also the way we interact with the land, working to restore balance and biodiversity and health to our planet and all peoples. Okay, so with that, um, we've got a number of people. We've got 27 people in the house, which is awesome. So, um, so let's start talking about noise. Um, so noise is defined as unwanted and or harmful sound. And many cities all over the world are wrestling with an increase in sound levels that are impacting more people than ever before. So we're gonna get to our guests, but before we do that, I'd like to know who's in the room and how noise impacts you. If you've attended any of my webinars before, you know that I like Mentimeter and Mentimeter is a way for us to learn from you in an anonymous way. So in the data, you are assigned a number and all answers that you provide are attributed to that number. So what this means is that after we ask you about your most disturbing or bothersome noise source, please answer all the following questions with that noise source in mind. And then uh, all data will be shared with our guests. So let's get going. I'm gonna share my screen here and start that. So I'm first gonna start this with the instructions. So if you haven't already done so, scan the QR code with your phone um, and, um, or you can go to a desktop, another window and go to menti.com and enter that code. So. The first question is, well, here's, here's the list of questions. We're gonna go through the first five. So the first question is, what interest group do you represent? So if you haven't already answered, oh, we've got 54 answers now, which is great. We had 49 before the webinar. So some of you are already doing your homework. <clears throat> um, Claire, I see that you, uh, you, have, you have a comment in the chat there. So the link is in the chat and also the QR code is on the screen. So what interest group do you represent? Mostly residents, which is common. I absolutely, uh, and residents associations, which is awesome because you represent way more people. Um, civil society org, two from the industry and one other. Um, for the person, if you're online and you mentioned other, please um, pop your other in the chat so that I know what, uh, what, uh, what your other is. The next question, what noise source bothers you most? And this I find always interesting. Um, 
So we've got the winner by a long shot, by almost double, is moving vehicles. Oh, so here we've got 25 there. The next one is amplified sound or loud people and yelling, which is 11. Um, we now have seven on construction, six for sirens, beepers, and horns, five for gas-powered lawn equipment, four others. Others, please put your other in the chat. Okay, condo HVAC. Yeah, I got that. Um, three for stationary air sources and residential air conditioners. I have stationary vehicles in there because that is all that the city of Toronto can enforce. So I just want to, I always want to poke at that a little bit. And fireworks. I know fireworks, none, nobody has answered fireworks here, but fireworks season is coming. Maybe we'll be reminded of that soon. Next question. So this is why I like to have all the answers associated because now we can start to segment. And so you are disturbed by noise during the day. And I I wish I could change the color scheme on this. I have to pay more money to do that. So at this point we are with what we have, but we can see that um, moving vehicles disturbs people 45% frequently or almost all the time. It is clearly the most um, annoying noise source in that sense. It's also the most common. Um, amplified sound is also ranks right up there for frequently and almost all the time, 16% and 15% and occasionally 17%. Um, I always find these super interesting. So I hope that that is, I hope you find that as well. Next question. I am disturbed by noise at night. So nighttime for people that study noise is basically the nighttime measurement is from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And that is when our bodies are meant to, um, meant to, that is when our bodies are meant to uh, rest and recover. So we have um, 44% again, frequently, 56% almost all the time for moving vehicles and 38% for occasionally. And some are rarely, rarely was just popping up there as well. Okay, and then how does noise physically bother you? So lots of answers here. Um, I'm gonna answer this question. I'm, I'm gonna ask this question slightly differently next time so that we can group them a little bit better. But of course the biggest words are the ones that are most popular, anxiety, stress, tension, insomnia, um, anger um, is not a physical manifestation, but it certainly then comes out in, in a physical way. Um, headache, frustration, tension, and lots, lots of um, one word, like one answers that, um, that no, no sleep after 7 a.m., shakes the house, irritated, disturbed activities. Lots of answers here. This will be, um, this will be shared with you. Okay, so with that, I am now going to stop sharing. And let's get to our first guest. So, uh, Tor, if you don't mind coming up on screen here. Um, Tor Oyamo, I have had, I'm going to actually just... Um, do a couple things here. I'm going to remove my spotlight. There we are. And I'm going to start to spotlight tour in a second. So, so I have had the pleasure of sharing the airwaves, screens, and stages um, with Tor to educate others from his decades of research on noise pollution. We are really very lucky to have an engaged expert like him in our midst. Um, so Tor, please tell us a bit about yourself the soundscape you live in and how noise impacts you or how noise impacts our physical health. And I'm going to spotlight you and you should be able to share your screen. All right. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for joining everyone. It's great to see the le level of engagement uh, growing seemingly quite, quite quickly too. Um, just put me in. This. So yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I don't know what much what what more to say. Uh, I'm an associate professor at um, TMU. Um, switch that. Does that look good now? It certainly does. Tell us your soundscape. What you what you uh, what you live with? Sure. Um, oh, just to add, I'm also a visiting researcher at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. I've uh, been that for a couple of years now. So at, at the end of this talk, and maybe uh, going slightly into the, the, the shared policy discussion we have planned, Ingrid, I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. 
uh, but my soundscape um, traffic is really the the only thing that that annoys me, and it and it gets uh, fairly fairly annoying sometimes. We're on a city street with uh, where the speed limit's forty, but unfortunately that street has a yellow line in the middle of it, which I think uh, gives people the idea that they're on a country highway. So speed average speed limit or speed is probably closer to seventy kilometers an hour. So that's That's my my personal battle, I guess, which uh, very much overlaps with with the work uh, that I do as well. So I just want to talk a bit about the work that I do. Some of this, uh, ho well, hopefully, this is not too much repetition for those of you that have seen me before. Um, and that's that's mostly focused on exposure assessment. That's really my main area of focus. And then uh, I'll talk a bit about the research uh, that's been used for and, and that's been done by others in, in Canada um, with respect to health and how that's really just, uh, in, in most cases, re reinforcing the findings that are well established out there anyway. And then uh, the project that I've been working on in, in Norway, I think, provides a good um, case study of how things can perhaps be done differently, though by any means these uh the way things are worked on there are, are, are not all transferable here but i think there's some good lessons uh to learn from from looking elsewhere uh, i like to bring this up i'm not sure if it's encouraging uh or depressing but uh in the picture there is is uh, uh what's called official official noise uh abatement commission from new york city had a noise measurement vehicle back in the 1930s uh, and the right picture there is is really when we see the, the advent of of our our modern and standardized methods for for um, quantifying noise exposures, which was uh, around airports in particular with military airports in the U.S. Uh, for better or for worse, we're still using a lot of the same same uh, methods to um, to to classify noise exposure. And then, uh, although it's focused on air pollution, this New England Journal of Medicine paper in the 90s was one of the first ones, if not the most important paper on environmental exposures on a large scale that really set in motion the type of research that we do today, which is where we're able to look at really large populations over long periods of time uh, and, and get strong, robust, and, and reliable, uh, what we call longitudinal um, uh, epidemiological data and evidence, uh, which again, uh, we're, we're starting, at a, starting to get a lot uh, for noise now. Uh, as far as monitoring goes, um, or mo assessment goes, uh, the dosimeter is mostly used in, in occupational settings. Uh, environmental monitoring is part of the overall picture uh, in, in most contexts, but for a regulatory perspective, it's really just used in, in, in small uh, localized studies where they want to perhaps capture the background noise level before they do some modeling and understand how much that existing noise is going to be exceeded by expansion of a road or, or a new railway or a new bridge or whatever it might be. Uh, and then that that approach of, of modeling, which is very much just um, based on pre pre existing data, we call it deterministic because we know very well how sound waves behave in the environment. So if we know what the environment looks like, uh, it's it's relatively straightforward to to assess uh, how sound waves behave and where they bounce between and and how uh, essentially any window, any facade. Uh, of any building in any city can can be assessed in, in pretty high specific detail for a specific source. Uh, now we've lately also started doing a bit more hybrid approaches where we get more of a, a an idea of the overall mix or the overall noise levels that might be present uh, in a city. So the the good thing is we get this overall understanding, but the bad thing is we don't necessarily know how. Uh, where those are coming from, what they're being caused by, which of course uh, makes it more difficult to to go on and, and do something uh, about it. Um, so this is, I, I just want to talk about this a bit because uh, a bunch of meetings that I've had with community groups and even individuals uh, lately uh, have come down to um, this issue of the equal energy principle being applied was essentially where we average the, the sound pressure the energy from sound pressure waves over a certain time period to get the level that's assessed. So that might be an eight hour period uh, during the night or 16 hour period during the day. 
for a 24 hour period. Um, and that's what's in regulations. It's what's in our, our noise pollution control guidelines for the province. And that's what's often used when, for example, uh, the province will, will go in uh, or are being asked to, to check if provincial guidelines are being exceeded. Uh, they might be experiencing very loud, extremely disturbing sounds at regular intervals, but because of this equal energy principle, uh, it might not actually exceed the levels uh, that are averaged out over a certain uh, time period. So this is a big hole, a, gape, a gaping gaping gap in, in, in regulation uh, that, that gets applied to uh, you know, all kinds of contexts and, and it should not really be applicable to all types of sources and all types of scenarios. Uh, racetracks are in this issue. Um, quarries uh, have been also uh, discussed with me as, as uh, sort of passing, passing regulation, but certainly not passing uh, what should be expected. Uh, we have in Ontario and every jurisdiction uh, around most parts of the world these, these standards that are applied for, for road, road, rail, and air uh, and industry. Uh, we, we do have those here as well. Uh, like I said, residential estimates are based on time of day and, and the most exposed facade. We also talk about um, living area exposure and, and uh, bedroom exposures plane of bedroom window exposures in Ontario regulations too. So this is, it's good that it's acknowledged and, and uh, specified in that way. Uh, and then uh, as a major jurisdiction, the EU and, and its totality uh, have been working on a long time to streamline and, and synergize the different models and methods that different countries were using to the point where now uh, it's it's the same model, so we shouldn't see differences between countries, uh, and, and they're all following the same uh, directive. Uh, noise mapping in in Canada, so this this assessment, uh, these types of assessments that we need to do to get a better understanding of people's uh, health uh, impacts, as well as opportunities to improve those, of course, uh, is, is really still in very much in its uh, infancy. Um, I've, I've taken and taking part in, in a bunch of these assessments. Uh, top left is an image of downtown Toronto with uh, 3D assessments. Uh, bottom left is from uh, the Toronto Noise Study that I work with, Toronto Public Health. Uh, on the right is, is a paper with uh, a bunch of colleagues that we did some different cities uh, across Canada, major cities uh, with this hybrid type of approach. Uh, but these are, these are one-offs. They've generally not been uh, repeated. Uh, the first repetition might be when I hopefully soon redo Toronto. So we don't know really what trends are, uh, if, if not only to understand how demographic and population growth within these cities is changing exposure. So even if it doesn't get louder, uh, we're, we're seeing more people be, be ex exposed and, and keeping track of that is important. Uh, just a good example, I think, of, of the types of different types of noise uh, sound environments we might uh, we might live in, depending on where we are in the city. Uh, on the top top right uh, are are averages from uh, over two hundred monitors throughout the entire city over a twenty four hour period. So, as you see from midnight to go sort of bottom out around three, and as you would expect, uh, kind of stays elevated throughout the day and then goes down in the evening. Uh, on King Street, uh, among 10 or 12 different monitors that we had there during um, the, the pilot uh, study for the King Street Priority Corridor, which was, of course, made permanent, uh, quite a bit more chaotic, uh, I suppose. And, and you can see levels uh, you know, in and around 70 decibels, basically, at any time uh, of the day. So it's important to know uh, and understand how how, uh, how what types of places uh, and how many people live in those places um, for for our understanding of, of noise exposure and health. Uh, these are just some some nice looking maps. I think they're nice anyway, but really just showing, um, of course, the focus of, of, of noise levels around our major arteries and, and highways throughout the city. Uh, just. To, a few, a few uh, findings from that. Um, these are the averages from noise from the from the monitors, which are, of course uh, should be with a grain of salt because um, you know are they really representative based on where they were located? Uh, but based on using similar approaches to 
to de determine locations in different cities, um, it's safe to say Toronto is pretty loud. Uh, LDEN of, of 66 decibels as well uh, above you know, any recommended level uh, and well into uh, levels where we see significant and strong health effects. Uh, what concerns me beyond that, and perhaps uh, I feel more urgency about, is, is the fact that we placed a bunch of monitors around schools and long-term care facilities, hospitals, uh, and we see, of course, many of them are made, located on major roads, so it's not, not surprising, but uh, these, these types of noise levels in those locations uh, is, is really, really problematic in, in my view. Uh, some of the main findings there, 60% uh, of spatial variability is, is by traffic, traffic then being the major uh, determinant reflected by the survey at the beginning of the today's session. Uh, higher levels in sensitive areas and sites of concern like schools, 27% of residents exposed to 24 hour levels of 65 decibels uh, or higher. So the, these are based on facade estimates, so people's, uh, people's houses, their, the walls on their houses. 93% above WHO um, nighttime guide, uh, noise guideline levels. Uh, and and uh, concerningly, concerningly as well, significant differences by socioeconomic um, status. Oh, this is a bit of a mis misplaced slide, but related to the work that was done uh, in other uh, cities across Canada. So um, having those numbers in mind for for uh, for averages and and uh, both from from measurements and exposure assessments by modeling uh we can see pretty quickly that we're um well above um what what the WHO uh, European region has recommended for um for vehicle traffic 53 decibels 45 at night uh, railways 54 44 at night uh and 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 so on so Lots of opportunity for improvement. Um, similarly to noise assessment, we're, we're somewhat limited in the type and, and, and health studies that have been conducted in, in Canada too, but there's been been a few. Um, in Toronto, uh, we did a survey and found high annoyance uh, in different neighborhoods ranged from 20 to 33% uh, across Canada. Um, at large, uh, Health Canada found that around 10.5% are annoyed by traffic noise in urban areas. But again, keep in mind that's that's uh, across the entire country, a uh, survey of about 6,000 people. Uh, sleep disturbance, uh, some colleagues in Montreal uh, looked at that and found, of course, not surprisingly, that it's related to environmental noise as well as specific transportation uh, sources. Uh, probably most the most comprehensive study uh, we, we did in, in Toronto, we looked at long-term uh, effects and a number of health out outcomes. Uh, those are the bottom two points where we found, or the bottom point where we found uh, increased risks of diabetes, hypertension, uh, heart attacks, heart failure. A shorter term study in Toronto found uh, acute effects of noise on endothelial function and heart rate variability. I saw some, some people had mentioned uh, Palpitations and, and and fast heart rates uh, and the effects. So those are certainly verified by by research. Uh, and then probably the, the 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 original health study in Canada, uh, but still relatively recent in, in 2012, uh, found increased risk for cardiovascular mortality uh, from traffic noise. Uh, we also have it's quite easy to show in, in any different way that you slice it. Um, this is an unfortunate. Um, increased burden of, of noise among low, lower uh, socioeconomic status groups uh, in, in both Toronto and Montreal and presumably uh, other cities as well. So some, some good points throughout the years, um, uh, apart from Ingrid pushing a lot of it forward now, uh, the City of Toronto Board of Health did adopt uh, an action plan for noise back in 2018. We've yet to see that come to fruition. I'm sure it's going to come. Uh, they recommended also to the province that ambient noise regulations be implemented. Uh, there's There's been some work at the City of Toronto with equity opportunity zones and, and noise being included in that. Uh, and of course, that transit corridor is eventually implemented, not solely because of noise, of course, uh, but that was that was a uh, part of part of their decision making um, in, in making it permanent. 
Uh, I won't go really through uh, the details of this, but a challenge in, in the Canadian context is how our responsibilities are divided between different levels of, of government. And uh, uh, we see some finger pointing just even within Toronto, but there's also finger pointing really between different uh, levels of, of government uh, as to who's responsible and who really should be leading the way and making a significant change in that will reduce our noise exposures. Uh, in Ontario, these these uh, guidelines that I mentioned are, are the most uh, important ones um, used for residential development, for example. And and the levels that are set in them do reflect um, the the you know state of state of the research currently. But uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, loopholes, a lot of opportunities to exceed these levels with, uh, for example, use of, of air conditioners and, and just uh, expecting people not to open their windows ever uh, and, and, and grandfathering in noise, uh, exceeding noise levels uh, for, for road, um, road construction, for example. Uh, just quickly then, hopefully, uh, what I've been working on in Norway as contrast, uh, quite, quite different. Um, they have different acts as we do in, in Canadian federal and provincial jurisdictions too that are sort of tangentially related and can be used to enforce uh, noise. They're used more uh, vigorously there than they are here, but most the most significant difference is uh, specific noise levels that are noted in the Pollution Act, uh, which which says if any indoor environment exceeds 42, 42 decibels, uh, whoever is responsible for uh, creating that noise has to pay to mitigate either at source or receptor uh, or during transmission, whatever whatever it might be. That's that's a huge uh, huge difference and one that gives a lot of authority to to um, to noise uh, guidelines and, and planning and, and just really integrating noise as part of the the entire uh, you know across the board in, in terms of building and, and evolving and developing a city. Uh, what I worked on was even, or continue to work on is even uh, perhaps at a higher level than this. So thanks to these, these strict regulations um, being enforceable, uh, they've also had the, the, um, these, these national goals uh, in place for a number of years now, they expired uh, in 2020. So what we're working on now is, is updating these goals and coming up with new uh, indicators to measure progress and, and continue to improve, which essentially mean just reducing the proportion of people that are uh, exposed uh, in, in excess uh, as, as population growth and, and uh, densification continues there as well. Um, just last, some of the key, key differences, I know I've been going fast here, but uh, that legally binding uh, exposure limits, very important. Um, the, these national or provincial goals for improvement, which which brings with it a whole ecosystem of, of assessment um, and performance-based indicators. Uh, we, we don't have any of that here uh, yet. Uh, they're fortunate in one way to be able to uh, sort of piggyback on EU regulations or EU standards for, for exposure assessment and impact assessment, uh, but they've nonetheless been doing that on their own and their own way for a long time too. Uh, and then this integration into legal frameworks across the transmission chain, uh, you know, holding the road authorities, the railway authorities, the cities, the provinces, you know, everyone really has to be on the same page um, because, because uh, they're required to. And then, uh, of course, key is is realizing that there are cultural differences. Um, you know, this this wasn't uh, an environment built around the automobile, like many cities around here were. There's also natural and, and built environment differences. Of course, no city compares in any way to to Toronto and the size of that and the types of noise you might more so expect in a metropolitan area. Uh, and then, you know, di different natural geographic features that that changes uh, how how things work as well. So I think I've used enough time. I will I'll leave it there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tor. Uh, let me just um, remove spotlight. There we go. And would you mind stop stopping to share your screen? Yep.
Thank you. So everyone, I'm seeing some really great comments in the chat <clears throat> and questions, and I promise we will get to some of them, especially when it talks about the differences of health impacts between startling noise, consistent noise, DBA, DBC, that kind of thing. So we'll get back to uh, Tor on that. Um, but let's transition now to Dr. Yoring, Dr. Doring, Dian. And um, but before we do that, what I want to do is I've got another Menti question for you that, of course, is related to this subject matter. So I'm going to share my screen again. And the question is, how does the noise that you put initially in your uh, in your in the Menti meter, how does this noise mentally and or emotionally bother you? So here we have anger, anxiety, stress, frustration. We've got 58 responses in here. <clears throat> and what I found was kind of interesting is anxiety and stress. I just need to activate that screen. Anxiety and stress basically are both under the physical answers and also under the mental and emotional answers. So I see Jan, I see you nodding your head. So um, let's uh, let's go over to you and 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 hear more about your your research and this this amazing opportunity to understand how noise impacts us. So let us know a little bit more about you, what your soundscape is that you um, I'm just going to ask you to unmute. Yeah, I think you should be able to. There you go. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to put you on a spotlight. So tell us a bit about yourself, your soundscape, and this amazing opportunity. Thanks. Great. So yes. Uh, hi, and thanks, Ingrid, for organizing this event and for everything that you do, really. I appreciate it. And I know a lot of other people, too. And uh, thanks to everyone who came today. So my name is Jan Döring. I'm a professor of sociology here in town at the University of Toronto before that. I was a professor at McGill for seven years. And just to speak about soundscape, I'm interested in noise as a researcher, but like many people here, I also have a personal connection to noise. Uh, I feel very strongly affected by motor vehicle noise. It really gets under my skin. I find it really upsetting and disruptive whether I try to focus or relax. It's something that just bothers me quite a bit. And this was the case when I moved to Toronto from Montreal already, but then I noticed that Toronto is quite a bit louder, actually, than Montreal is. And that's been quite an adjustment for me this year. And I used to live in Leslieville, close to an arterial road, which was very loud. Now I live in Runnymede, which is fortunately much quieter, but I still, of course, hear it as I go through the city and of course also when I talk to other people and so it stuck with me and it's also awakened this interest in researching this this topic so now I'm doing research uh, on noise and I'm actually hoping that I might be able to convince some of you to participate or to at least become curious about participating and perhaps forward this information to some people who might be so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak here today so my, uh, let me first tell you a bit about my research approach. I do research on people's everyday lives, on people's perceptions, their emotions, and of course, their actions, their behavior in the city. And I do this from a very open-ended perspective that really builds quite directly on what people say and do. So it's quite a bit different from survey-based research or research that draws on big data, for example. Uh, my work is always in conversation with findings and theories from that work. Uh, but in that way, it's unique. And really, my main methods of, of gathering data are in-depth interviews where it take a lot of time to really hear someone out on their experience uh, and also participant observations where I go to relevant events and just see what goes on there to learn, for example, what people are proposing to address noise or what their grievances are. So yeah, and specifically about this research project that's coming up, I am going to, with research assistants uh, over this summer, interview Toronto residents about noise and especially experiences of noise that people have in the home. And there, we're really interested in any kind of noise that bothers people, whatever that might be, motor vehicle noise, noisy neighbors, construction noise, amplified sound, leaf blowers, really anything at all that might bother people. And we're going to visit people at home to do the interviews, to make it more convenient to participate, but also because we're hoping that by being in the home, participants might be able to show us where particular uh, noise problems are coming from and how they relate to how one can live in, in, in the home that, that you have, right? We would want to learn about uh, things that are 
often not necessarily addressed in statistical research to get more, a more contextual image of what exposure to, to noise looks and feels like. So for example, uh, we would like to know how it affects people in the moment. So what is it that you're doing in the moment that noise occurs? How does it shape how you go on or not going on with that activity? How might it change your relationships as now we're angry or anxious after being exposed to noise uh, for uh, and so on? And then of course, in the long-term effects um, where something like mental health can certainly come in. I know this through personal experience myself. Um, we're interested in how people may try to adjust to noise. Uh, so for example, we want to learn about your white noise machines, earplugs, your meditation and yoga habits, installing new windows if you can afford to do it. Some people might even think about moving or have done it if they can afford it. Of course, many people can't. Anything else that people do to cope with noise. And then Perhaps most importantly, we want to know what people are doing and demanding to reduce noise in the city. And of course, all of you are already doing at least one thing. You're coming to events uh, from No More Noise Toronto. And I'm sure many of you are doing other things as well, whether that means calling city councillors or talking to your neighbors about noise. Or yesterday I talked to someone who went to court and, and won a case there that was noise related. So so those kinds of stories and and you know, efforts that you are making, we're also very curious about. And so to find answers to all of these questions, we simply ask people to share their story. And that's quite different from checking a box on a survey. We really want to hear what you have to say in detail and in context, and we'll make sure that we have the time to really listen to you, uh, whether that's for 30 minutes or for three hours. I've done the whole span. It's up to you, however much time you can set aside for doing this. We'll be very happy uh, to take it. Um, you might wonder why we're doing this. What's the point of doing all that? So first, I'm definitely hoping to make academic contributions in the narrow sense. Uh, I don't know how Tor feels, uh, uh, although I, I think I do. Uh, as researchers, we're always interested in new concepts, data, and theories, and I'm no exception to that. So we're nerds, so to speak, in our particular field uh, of interest, and this applies to me as well. But I also always care about my work having practical relevance and at least the possibility for making an impact. Um, and the kinds of data, the stories that I collect often do produce quite a bit of interest from the wider public. So I've written blog posts for the wider public, newspaper articles, I've gone on the radio uh, and things like that. And I have good connections there. And when I do this, I draw on the stories that people share with me. That's really what I, what I do. I disseminate those stories. Um, so I'm definitely hoping to build awareness of noise as a problem that people are facing, what their demands and frustrations are, what toll noise can take, and so on. And that might build empathy, understanding, and hopefully ultimately uh, change. So of course, no one ever knows what happens in response to efforts of doing that. And so I can't promise anything, but uh, I'll do my best to contribute here uh, through the study. Um, I just mentioned a few details if you are interested in participating. So first, I wanted to tell you, if you are concerned about this, you have the option of participating anonymously. For example, if your concern is with a neighbor or, or with, with any source of noise that you might be afraid of in, in, in some, some form uh, or not, right? If it's just something you prefer, in that case, we can give you a pseudonym and then we remove your name, address, and any other sensitive information from your transcript so you can remain anonymous and we can nonetheless build on your information uh, to, to build the study. Um, participating is easy and often it's also fun. People tell me that they, that they enjoy the experience and that they like having the time to really lay their story out for someone who listens to them uh, with with interest, which is something that we will definitely do. You don't have any, you don't have to prepare anything and we'll prepare we'll, we'll do our best to accommodate your schedule. I have a toddler and so my flexibility is limited, but my research assistants don't and so they should accommodate you in the evenings or whenever really you're willing to talk. And during the interview, you can always decline questions if you like. You can break off the interview. If after the interview you feel, oh, I said things that I just don't want to see you, so that didn't come out right, then you can write to us and say, please remove it and we'll remove it, right? So you can you can do that as well. 
And as a token of our appreciation, after interviews, we send out gift cards, $25 gift cards to thank you for your time. It's really just a, a sign that we value your time. Uh, those cards are for President's Choice, so Lob Loss. We decided for now not to participate in the boycott. Uh, if any of you are participating in the boycott, I'm happy to work on an alternative and see what we can do for you there uh, instead. I don't think this should be challenging for us. So I hope that some of you might be interested or perhaps that you can think of people who might be. And in that case, please just send a quick email, no specific information needed to our study address. And that is, this is my high tech way of showing you this, noise in the city at utoronto.ca. If you know that Zoom reverses text when you show it down, yes. and you know that I've actually had to, uh, you know, uh, uh, inverse it, and I and I figured out how to do that yesterday. Well, so it's still reversed here, though. <laughs> it is reversed. Yeah, it is reversed. But nice try. You get kudos for trying. <laughs> Let me give me one second. I think I have the other. <laughs> one. Well, folks, you see, this is how we roll. We we learn as we go. <laughs> there we are. I, I do not have it. I apologize. Oh, but the, that's but the email is noise in the yeah. city at utoronto.ca. Uh, and um, you can also email me personally. You can find me if you Google me. My institutional address uh, is online. And we'd be happy to get back to you with questions. Or if you're just ready to participate, we can do that too. If you're a member of a residence association or another group where you think members might be interested in participating, I have a little uh, flyer that you can attach to a message that you could send out if that's something that you might consider doing. We would be very appreciative of that. Really, any help that you can provide, uh, we would greatly uh, appreciate. Thanks. And uh, here and later, I'm happy to address any questions or concerns that people might have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jan. I am just um, copying your, trying to copy your email address from my Gmail into, would you mind typing your, your email address into the chat? That would be great. Right. Thank you so much. So um, a couple things. You were looking to interview people here in Toronto, correct? So anybody outside of Toronto um, or are you doing this virtually as well? There you go. Yeah, we're doing it in person and we want to stay in the city for now. Um, so it, it's really for people in the city and the urban agglomeration. So if people live in the suburbs, that's just fine as well. Okay, uh, here we go. I'm actually going to, people are wanting your, so I'm going to give, I'm going to copy your, oh, there we go. You got it. Okay. Your your um, posts are only showing up to, your replies in the chat are only showing up to the hosts and panelists. So I'm just copying oh. and putting them in the chat there. So I now have... Jan's um, personal email address in there as well. Um, so Jan, I, I earlier on, I put a link in the chat regarding that article about who likes a loud car and about the, the tendencies that people have found um, about, you know, that there's a higher incidence of psychopathy and sadism in people that like to have loud vehicles. Any comments on that before we go into some other Q&A? Yeah, so Ingrid knows this, and I haven't mentioned this here. I'm planning a second project component where I'm hoping to interview people who have these modified vehicles and and performance vehicles uh, and whatever the case might be to learn more about their perspective. What are they trying to communicate? Who do they think their audience is? Uh, what, what's their goal, right? And how do they choose where they drive? How do they choose when they drive? I've read uh, what we know about this so far. It's not particularly detailed, so I want to find out more. Uh, the The article that Ingrid is referring to um, is very interesting. So it's, I think we would say today, if you have uh, heard the term before, probably um, we could call it a toxic masculinity explanation, right? Probably men and young men who are trying to... Um, claim masculinity with the help of these vehicles that, that are very loud and, and disturbing. And I think that is probably true to some extent, but there's definitely more going on there. I think that many people who have those kinds of psychological dispositions don't do this, right? They might be doing kickboxing instead or going to the gym and pumping iron or whatever the case might be. And so why this as a choice and how people get into this kind of activity 
what they try to indicate with it is something that I think we still need to find out. And so I'm not saying it's wrong, but I think it's just part, it's part of an explanation. And so I would want to uh, ask people uh, more questions there as well, right? To, to find out more. And my, my hope there would be eventually to find out how we might make it possible, how it might be possible to discourage aggressive loud driving. Awesome. Well, I think there's a bunch of us here that are right on side with you there. Um, Tor, I see your hands up and you are still on mute there. So uh, you, you have you have some thoughts to chime in here? Don't know. Don't know if this is the top topic that we wanted to focus on today, but I just wanted to add to that um, to, to be careful a bit to stereotype a, a group, the, the people that are doing this, but that study was focused on uh, basically university age people only it was a very you know limited demographic sample uh and uh you know that there there's uh definitely two groups if you want to start grouping it you know there's there's groups that are doing it because of you know enhanced uh performance vehicle performance right like they're doing it uh you know it's sort of secondary that it makes noise but they like that it increases the horsepower output of their vehicles you know i I was there myself in younger days. I had I had motorbikes. I like machines that that worked well. Uh, it wasn't to the point to make noise. But then there's I think there's a there seems to be a group now that are really just making noise. I've noticed more of these these vehicles that are certainly not certainly not performance vehicles and have extremely loud exhausts on them. So you know there's there's uh, some some changes going on I think in that in that culture or perhaps a a, a new culture that has developed lately too, which maybe falls more in line with that but yeah, i think should should be a little bit careful um with with sort of putting a label on that entire, mm -hmm. that entire population as young mentioned there's a lot of things going on great well thank you so while i have you guys on screen here there has been some i've been looking at the chat and so tor could you help us understand um the differences of health impacts when it the difference between the intermittent peak noise events versus an ambient sound like a stationary air conditioner or um, some other stationary or even amplified music that takes place over a longer period of time. Are there differences in the health impacts between those two types of uh, noise? Uh, it's a tricky question in one way, but the sh short answer is no, <laughs> right? Like a lot of the results from short-term studies, uh, you know, where people go in and, and do sort of intense, you know, bio, biometric monitoring with, with heart rate and blood pressure or even blood samples after, uh, you know, a short-term noise exposure and see raises, raised, you know, cortisol and stress hormone levels, you know, all these things that have actually been documented and were understood before we look at the, the long-term effects people were doing probably at experiments that wouldn't be approved by an ethics committee today on on noise effects on people uh back in the 70s and 80s right like mm -hmm. start you know <laughs> putting someone in a lab and just like not telling them and a super loud noise is going to come and, and things like that uh so we know how the body responds in the short term and and the assumption really and what is what is happening is that you know just repeated those things repeated over and over and over over again over a long time will lead to that, you know, the, the chronic impacts. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're linked, uh, you know, of, of course, uh, I guess from, from policy and, and the general, our general perspective, uh, we're all gonna be startled by noise now and then. So we, we worry less sort of about, about um, the, those sh short-term events in long-term studies than we do about the overall exposure because most of the time those, those uh, you know, if you're repeatedly exposed to loud short-term events, you're that's going to show up in 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 uh, in, in a sort of long-term assessment of noise too. So yeah. places that are louder in general also have a lot more short-term loud noises. If people move away from that, or somehow that noise source is um, uh, removed, do those health impacts go away? Like, do the arteries 
start to relax and not stiffen? Do they start to unclog? Is this like many of us that are on this call are suffering? I have a history of stroke in my family and I'm like, great, I now thanks to these guys. Uh, you know, so if I move away to quiet chirping birds and in nature, will the health impacts that I already have now, will those reduce over time? I beyond speaking in my, my common understanding of you know removing a removing a stressor will will likely lead to improvement but uh I, I can't think of a study it's an, it's a really good study design can't think of uh, one off the top of my head where they've looked at people moving specifically to a, to a quieter area and seen if, if, if improvements have, have come uh, I would have to look for that I imagine it's been done but I can't think of one yeah. Okay. Um, and then there's been some questions and, and there's a lot of talk about DBA and DBC and DBZ. Um, and so, so DBA, I'm just going to quickly paraphrase here. DBA is basically the decibel weighting that we can, it's, it's um, discounted so that we can, about what we can hear. DBC is a little bit wider and it can actually encompass what we can feel. It encompasses more of the lower bass beats. And then DBZ is no weighting at all. And many of the like amplified sound, I was in a concert on Friday, a couple Fridays ago, and it was 31.5 Hertz is what they were just blasting me with. And I was like, holy smokes, when they, when he stopped, I felt like I just had a workout and I was like, oh, that was exhausting. So are there any health impacts, different health impacts between DBA and DBC or like how, how can, how can we amplify that message, I guess? <laughs> Yeah, I saw I saw a comment about sort of uh, you know, direct effects of sonic pressure on on triggering uh, nerves, which might be the case, but um, I, I don't really have a good answer to that, unfortunately. But the you know DBA has been shown to to be the most effective for for a number of reasons in you know a, a large scale urban setting where. Uh, you know, transportation noises for the most part are are the concern. That you know, perhaps to some detriment, um, ha has has led to its use and other for other sources that it that it shouldn't be used for. So I think there's definitely a better use of of DBC or Z or un unweighted metrics um, for for certain for certain sources. And I don't think that was really ever the idea of, for example, the International Commission on the effects of, you know, bi biological effects of noise. You know, they're kind of the ones advising, for example, the, the WHO uh, over the years. You know, it's the collection of, of noise experts, essentially. Essentially, um, you know, the, the DBA. You know, it's 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 the way to go for um, for transportation sources for the most part. Uh, but beyond that, you know, there's lots of opportunity to to use our. our Mm -hmm. uh, evidence and understanding and, and different metrics. It's just not used for big, big scale, you know, across an urban environment. That's, yeah. that's where I work most. Okay, I've got one more question here, and that is um, about frequency and how is frequency included within volume uh, measurements and in your in your research. Uh, so I, again, because I'm working on you know large area assessments, there's not really data capacity to to do, for example, octave band separation and, and modeling different frequencies uh, in that way. So you know we, we use uh, you know we use that single metric and, and even for for measurement, which is not commonly done on a large scale, right? It's more more so done on on a lo localized areas. Um, but on a large scale, it's not really feasible. Uh, it's cost prohibitive because the, the meters are so expensive. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it, it is used for for um, for local assessment. For example, you know, even even in environmental environmental assessments, if they're putting up like the type of monitor I showed earlier in the presentation and, and leaving it in place, you know, those have the capacity and, and will mm -hmm. capture uh, different frequencies of data. But there are no you know guideline requirements really to analyze those separately which is probably why you don't really see a lot of reference to it yeah from the audience in the in the in in here and also elsewhere frequency seems to be a real um driver of annoyance and and that type of thing um yeah. okay well um 
We've got some interesting, I love the stuff that's going on in the chat. Thank you everyone for participating and sharing in there. Um, we're at 12.55, so I'm going to do a little bit of a wrap up and um, and then we'll uh, have some final closing thoughts from Jan and Tor. So I'm going to quickly share my screen here again because there was one more, there's a couple more questions here. And so this one is related to Jan's research as well. How do you feel once the noise has stopped? And relieved is one of the biggest things. But when I was looking through this, um, there's a couple notes here, like there's nervous anticipation. When is it going to come again? I, I read another one. Um, white appreciation, grateful, angry, can't move. There was one um, damaged um, anger. It will return. And I remember um, somebody deputing regarding weights that were dropped in a gym very close to their home. And they were always wondering when are those weights going to drop again? And there's that constant being on edge, which is uh, which is a terrible feeling. Okay, so one more question here. And that is one that might be a little bit harder for people to sometimes answer. And uh, what do you want your city to sound like? Often we are so focused on what we don't what we don't want to hear that we don't know what we want to hear so here are some answers here we got 57 responses here and this is very people want people want to live at peace people want to be in their homes and um enjoy their homes and their homes should be a sanctuary not a place where they have no respite uh, there is not one room in my house that i don't hear a harley or a motorcycle or a vehicle um even over running water in the bathroom so for some of us, there is no escape. Um, okay, so with that, I am going to uh, stop sharing and I'm gonna pop a couple things into the chat and then I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a little bit of a wrap up here for me. And I'm gonna pop this in here. So I'm just popping in a bunch of links into the chat and I'm going to stop this and I'm just gonna bring you to my website. So No More Noise Toronto, we're a grassroots organization. Um, and this is, a, this is a link to my website. I also have, um, so each one of these is basically um, a, a little individual website on its own about what we are and what we're doing in the noise bylaw review and what we've done. And this is my not 311 noise report. So this is how people are able to um, blog noise reports at all hours, at all times for all reports for over 11,000 of these. So uh, this is really cool. And this will eventually um, be revamped and hopefully go national uh, or, or international. We now have attention down in the States. Um, and then just up here on the top right is where you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm working on an Instagram. Social media is kind of hard for me. Um, YouTube channel, Facebook, Eventbrite. All of our events are on Eventbrite. And um, we are, have a couple more coming up. So we've got No More Noise Toronto meetups. We're basically informal um, meetups where people can talk and we can create the community that we that we are. So this was today. We have one coming up on Saturday, May 18th at 1230 um, in the afternoon and then one on Thursday, May 30th at seven o'clock at night. And bookmark your calendars because I don't quite have it up here yet. But January, January, June 4th, uh, we are having a lunch and learn with municipal licensing and standards. So June 1st, new noise bylaws are coming in to re, uh, are, are gonna be implemented that were part of the review. And we're gonna have municipal licensing and standards answering your questions and letting us know about how those changes are gonna impact us. So I'm gonna be pointing some fingers at them too, but I'm so happy that they are um, very interested in, um... oh, I wasn't sharing, <laughs> oh well. There we go. Um, it's all, all the links are in the chat. Um, so uh, I'm very happy that they're willing to collaborate with us. So we are at 1259. Um, Jan, would you like to have uh, a couple final words and then Tor will go over to you and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Jan, go ahead. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting to be in Toronto at this time because Toronto is so dramatically changing and so fast becoming so bigger, so much bigger and so much denser. And as we see without really being prepared for it quite well, right? Like all of this has happened very quickly now without being done at the right time, which would have been to start everything much earlier and with much more consideration. And so 
I think these next years where the city really adjusts to the kind of population that it'll have over the next 10, 20 years are going to be really critical for shaping how the city will look, sound and feel like. And so I think this is a great time to be involved in this work because I think it can really set paths, uh, at least in the long run, hopefully also in the short run, for making sure that we live in a soundscape that we can accept. I like that. A soundscape we can accept. Absolutely. Tor, over to you. Yeah, just uh, thank thank you again and everyone in attendance. You know, uh, uh, as much as as research can produce evidence, you know, we we need people to uh, to really echo that and put put pressure on on uh, different institutions and and governments, uh, pe pe people in the right places. And and I know that's that's happening more and more now uh, in large part through uh, through your organization, Ingrid. So thank you and everyone here for supporting uh supporting that and uh yeah i just want to echo Jan's comment you know i think uh, you know i i talk about uh i mentioned before you know that there's there's uh well, there's noise and, and then there's us unnecessary noise you know that there's a lot of unnecessary noise we're not going to get to a point uh where a city like toronto is going to be as, as quiet as a small country hamlet of course uh yeah. but you know there, there's uh there's a reasonable limit to to what people should have to endure and i think uh you know it's it's in part it's in part cultural uh and, and part regulatory and uh you know comes down to people people demanding it so yeah i think we're yeah in the right direction absolutely and that was one thing when i started this i was i was like okay so i'm poking city hall i'm 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 showing there how 311 doesn't work and i i didn't know how they would respond to that and their response is Thank you. Thank you for doing this, because if it doesn't come from the public, they can't do it themselves and they don't know that they, they, they may know, but they just can't like there's those 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 restrictions that they have in place. So that's why I'm I'm we're working with um, MLS with Co consumer experience, customer experience division, which is 311. I've had conversations with Toronto Police Services. Now we're advocating for Toronto Public Health and the Toronto Advisory Accessibility Committee to make noise all part of their strategic priorities. So um, and they're receptive. Nobody's telling me it's not a problem. It's just how do we manage it? Um, Jan, I did see that you had your hand up again. Did you want to jump in? I meant to applause, but raise my hand instead. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, I don't know about you two. I, I'm happy to hang out for a few more minutes and uh, and chat with people if there is um, anybody here in the chat. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at the notice here. Ingrid, are you still installing noise meters? Yes, I am. Please email me at info at nomorenoisetoronto.com and you can do that. Um, and actually I'm just seeing a lot of people saying thank you. So I will just say thank you to everyone. And Jan, Tor, I, I'm just so thrilled that that we have this great collaboration going be between between two major universities and one grassroots organization that's doo -doo -doo -doo, making noise. So with that, I'm actually just gonna sign off and say thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Sleep well.